Joining us today to discuss this issue is Professor Thomas Sudendorf. Professor Sudendorf is a professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland in Australia. He's the author of numerous scientific articles and book chapters and has penned the new book, The Gap, The Science of What Separates Us from Other Animals. And he joins us today to discuss this uh, fascinating issue. Uh, professor Sudendorf, pleased to have you today on the Grok Science Show. Hello, Charles. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, certainly our pleasure. Certainly a great book you've written called The, uh, the Gap. Should you talk about what it is that separates us from other animals? Why did you decide to write this book? Well, this has been a passion of mine for much of my life. Why are we the peculiar creatures that we are? I mean, our bodies and our life stages are much the same as those of other animals, yet we seem to be so uh, fundamentally different from other creatures. We dominate this planet. Today, one estimate suggests that we constitute about eight times the biomass of all other wild terrestrial uh, vertebrates combined. So what is the basis of that success? What really separates us from other animals? So on the one hand, if you look at the biological side, humans are very much like other creatures, if you think about it. They differ from other animals only in, in very minor respects, really. I mean, we have a chin. We have lost our canines and much of our protective fur, leaving males to have this apparently pointless but pers persistent growth of beards. Our iris of our eyes is relatively small, surrounded by white rather than dark sclera making it easy for us to identify the direction of another's gaze. Human females show no outward markers of their fertile phase, and human males, you might be interested to know, lack a penis bone. Now, these are not exactly groundbreaking traits uh, that set us apart compared to, say, I don't know, the emergence of wings in birds, which predictably catapulted um, their bearers into a new sphere of possibility. Yet despite this paltry list of distinct attributes, we've changed the face of the earth. So I've, I think really that the basis of that is our mind rather than our body. And so I studied psychology and for the last 20 years have been grappling with this question of what it is about our minds that really sets us apart. It's not as easy to answer as one might have thought. And in fact, when I started off, I kind of thought that people would have figured it, had figured this out a long time ago. But the reality is that most people really have only intuitions about animal minds, and they are often in op opinions that are in stark contrast to each other. You see, on one extreme, we imbue our pets with all manner of characteristics, uh, treating them perhaps as if they are little people in furry suits. And on the other extreme, animals are often treated as mindless bio-machines. Just consider the ways uh, animals are sometimes treated in the food industry, really. And scientists, too, I discovered, often seem to defend these contradicting views, apparently aimed either at securing human dominance or at debunking human arrogance. So on the one hand, scholars boldly assert that humans are unique for one reason or another, and on the other, studies regularly claim to have demonstrated animal capacities that were previously believed to be uniquely human. Now, the truth of the matter, as often is the case with these kind of things, cannot, can typically be found somewhere in the middle. So in the gap, the book that I've just written, I survey what research really has established about mental capacities uh, with a particular focus in animals, with a particular focus on our closest living relatives, the great apes. And so I go through all the typical claims that are most commonly made in the literature, language, intelligence, foresight, thinking about thinking, culture, morality. And I find that in each one of these domains, animals share with us very important traits and sometimes more surprisingly sophisticated traits. Yet there are some things that seem to consistently set us apart. So in the book, I examine the most common proposals about what set us fundamentally apart from the rest, language, foresight, mind reading, that is thinking about thinking, intelligence, culture, morality. And I find that in each of those domains, animals have more sophisticated capacities than we often think they might. And in particular, our closest surviving relatives, the great apes, show uh, tremendous abilities in some of those domains. Yet in each of them, there are certain things that are uh, certain aspects that are still uniquely human. And to cut a long story short, I find that across all of those domains, there are two recurring features that distinguish the human version of these capacities from those of animals. The first one is our ability to imagine alternative situations, be they past, future, or entirely fictional scenarios, and embed them into larger narratives and reflect on them. And the second capacity is our, well, better motivation really, is our deep-seated drive to exchange our thoughts and our reflections and our experiences. So I think these two things really turn animal communication into open-ended human language, um, memory as you find in animals into human flexible foresight and so forth. And so forth. 
So our ability to think about alternative events, to start elaborating on that, if you like, um, and assemble them into larger narratives allows us to explain the present by considering how the past unfolded. It allows us to think about what the world is like for other people from another perspective. And most critically, perhaps, it allows us to imagine what the future might hold. We can, as it were, mentally travel in time. And we can think about several options and deliberately select one path to the future over another, giving us a sense of free will and an advantage over creatures that have less foresight. And this allows us to act prudently to avoid future disasters or to uh, take advantage of opportunities before they arrive. And we can prepare ourselves uh, about what the future will hold. I mean, just think of the things that are in your pocket right now. What, what do you have? You have like money and keys and condoms, um, cosmetics, and we carry these things with us because at some point or another we thought that they might come in handy at some future time. So we prepare ourselves for the future and we, make, uh, we plot the future and thereby perhaps control much of the planet in ways that other animals cannot. Yet there's a flip side to that, and that flip side is this way of making decisions is a risky, even though a flexible way of making decisions is a risky way of making decisions. And let's face it, we often get it wrong. We uh, think the future will be one way, and in reality it turns out to be quite another. So we often might not be able to actually predict the future appropriately. Now, this risky way of, of making decisions compared to, say, uh, uh, stimulus response learning and, and instinctual ways of making decisions, uh, this way uh, gives us immense flexibility, but it really might only work through this second trait that I mentioned, namely our fundamental desire to take advantage of what other people have learned and experienced. So we put our heads together and ask questions and uh, give advice. We teach each other, and thereby we um, can take advantage of the experiences of others in ways that others, other creatures may not. So this linking of our scenario building minds into larger networks ultimately creates, well, a second inheritance system, what we generally know as culture, where we socially maintain knowledge about how the world operates and how we can uh, take advantage of the situations and make do with the world and control it. And so this is over and above the genetic inheritance that um, we have and that other species have. So our extraordinary powers, I believe, really to bring it all together, really derives from our collective wit. What sort of adaptations have occurred then in the human brain that have allowed us to have these abilities? Right. Uh, surprisingly, we don't really know what it is about the human brain that sets us apart. Or, well, people often think that humans simply have the largest brains. From, of all the creatures on the planet, but that is patently not true. Our brains are large, 1.25 to 1.45 kilograms, but the brains of elephants and whales are much larger still, with uh, 4 kilograms and up to even 9 kilograms for whales, respectively. Now, elephants and whales also, of course, have the biggest bodies more generally, so one might argue that we need to take that into account. And indeed, in terms of relative brain size, we do better than elephants and whales. So our relative brain size is about 2%, whereas whales and elephants have less than 1% of their body B brain. Yet if we use relative brain size, we find that um, other creatures like shrews and mice turn out to have much larger relative brain sizes than us. They can have up to 10% of their body B brain. So since we get beaten by large animals in one scheme, and small animals in the other scheme, a third scheme has been devised that takes into account that as uh, mammals get larger, their brains get absolutely larger but relatively smaller. If we calculate a regression, then we make a prediction about what brain size you would expect for a mammal of our size. And there, um, we uh, have seven times larger brains than expected, and that actually puts us on top of other animals, with dolphins, as it turns out, being in second space. Uh, second place, they have about five times the expected brain size. But you wonder with these schemes, and I've contributed to one of these schemes myself and my colleague Andy White, uh, but you wonder really whether we're just using statistics to um, justify our own um, presumptions or whether we've really learned something new here. We just devise these schemes that somehow bring us on top and align other creatures in, in, in ways that, that make intuitive sense. But I don't think we really have understood yet what it is about our brain or our size that brings about the psychological traits that set us apart. So ultimately, therefore, I've been more interested in behavior and using behavior as an indicator for mental capacities to uh, answer this question. But perhaps in the future, we'll find out what it is about the human brain that really makes that possible. But at present, we don't know.
Why is it we don't really see that anything close to this in the closest mm. uh, apes, for example? Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's two sides to that one. One is that, um, as I already indicated, this individual scenario building is actually a very risky and resource-intensive way of, for an organism make, to make decisions. And therefore, a few species might have been in a position to take advantage of this approach. But we haven't actually been alone. As it turns out, there were several other species on this planet that have, this, have had these capacities as well, but they have all gone. They are all extinct. If we cast our mind back to, say, 40,000 years ago, we still shared this planet with other hominins, with Neanderthals, with um, Homo floresiensis, the hobbits of Flores, uh, with Denisovans, and possibly even with the remnant, last remnants of Homo erectus. So at that time, there were several species of upright walking, smart, tool using hominins on this planet. And if you had asked a human back then, what's the difference between us and the next creature, uh, the gap would have been much smaller than it is today. Go back to a million years ago, there were three entire differently, uh, entirely different genera of hominins on this planet. Australopithecines, Paranthropus, and Homo, each one comprising several uh, different species. So for much of our history, there were many different hominins on this planet. So in one way of answering the question why we are so distinct from other animals is because these other ho closest relatives of ours have uh, gone extinct. Now this, of course, raises the question why they have gone extinct. Like other extinctions, the extinction of hominins uh, probably involves numerous factors, you know, including radical environmental changes, ice ages, volcanic eruptions, and so forth. But for the disappearance of our close relatives, we should consider yet another potential culprit, and that is our own ancestors. You see, humans have caused many extinctions in more recent times for many animal species, and we've got a terrible record of genocide and warfare and violence as well. And even though violence probably has been reducing in recent times, Stephen Pinker wrote a wonderful book about that recently, uh, documenting how violence has decreased over history. So in other words, in the past, violence was much more prominent. And so we might have very well caused through our conflict with our close relatives uh, some of their uh, extinctions as well. The only other species, uh, which is quite interesting to note, that collaborates to kill members of its own kind are our closest surviving relatives, chimpanzees. It is quite possible that in one way or another uh, our ancestors have had a hand in the distinction, uh, extinction of our close surviving relatives and thereby destroying, as it were, the missing links. Burning the bridges across the gap, as it were, only to find ourselves on the other side of the divide, wondering how on earth we got here. Well, and of course it begs the question, what, what happens in, about it in the future? I mean, if you look at it, um, there's a good chance that we continue to widen the gap, because all the surviving ape relatives of ours, all the great apes, also the small apes, they're all uh, under threat of extinction, or they're critically close to extinction, and they are in that position for one reason and one reason only, and that is human activity. So it might very well be the case, unfortunately, that when our children and children's children compare themselves to the next closest relative, they will have to compare themselves to monkeys rather than apes. And monkeys, as you no doubt know, are quite distinct creatures from apes. They typically have a tail, they've got much small, smaller brains, and they don't show the same kind of uh, behavioral flexibility uh, that, that great apes demonstrate. There, there's the possibility that we widen the gap. But of course we can make moral decisions because we can think about the future. That's one of the things, as I said, that, that seems to set us apart. So we have the moral option to uh, try to avert that from happening. And I encourage everybody that is listening here to um, do their, uh, make their contribution to that and uh, stop that, those kind of extinctions from happening. So me personally, it's dear to my heart. I, I want us to make a much greater effort to preserve their habitats and, and try to protect them for their own sake as well as for the sake of our children and children's children. The new book is called again.